I'm David Knowles, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we bring you updates from the front lines, analyse the cafe bombing in St. Petersburg that killed Russian military blogger Vladlan Tartarsky, and we hear from our defence editor, Danielle Sheridan, who's been interviewing Ukrainian pilots. Bravery takes you through the most unimaginable hardships to finally reward you with victory. This hideous and barbaric venture of Vladimir Putin must end in failure. We need a military strategy for Ukraine to gain a decisive advantage on the battlefield, to win the war. Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday afternoon, we sit down with leading journalists from the Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's Monday, the 3rd of April, one year and 38 days since the full-scale invasion began. And today, I'm joined by our assistant comment editor, Francis Sternley, our defence editor, Danielle Sheridan, and foreign correspondent, James Kilner. I started by asking Francis for the latest updates. Thanks, David. It's good to be back. I'll begin with the big developments over the weekend in the Russian domestic scene, namely the bombing of a cafe in St. Petersburg yesterday that killed the well-known military blogger and strident supporter of Putin's war, Vladimir Tatarsky. Now, long-standing listeners will note certain echoes in the reaction and analysis of the apparent assassination with the killing of Daria Dujina in Moscow in August last year. Like with that case, there may be much more to this than initially meets the eye. So I should say off the bat that there are big caveats here and this is a very, very fast moving story. Now, the facts as we know them as things stand, Tatarsky, his real name being Maxim Famine, we understand was giving a talk on his frontline reporting at a bar believed to be owned by Yegevny Pogozhin, head of the Wagner Group. Russian police sources say that a bomb had been hidden in a statue that was given to him and it was designed to avoid being smelt by sniffer dogs at the door of the cafe. Then it was handed to him and detonated by remote control. The police also say that he was the only person killed in the blast, although 32 other people were injured and some seriously. Since then, Russia's investigative committee has announced the arrest of Daya Tripova on suspicion of involvement in Mr. Tatarsky's killing. Now, she's 26 and is a resident of St. Petersburg, who has previously been detained for taking part in anti-war rallies. And that's led to some speculation this morning that she may not really be responsible, but is being Uh, put up as a or conveniently arrested at this moment uh, in order to essentially use this as an excuse the Russian state to clamp down on those who've caused them issues in the past. Now Interfax initially reported her arrest on Sunday evening but later said that she was on the run while her mother and sister were summoned for questioning and I know James is monitoring this extremely closely and will no doubt have further updates once I've finished. Now, there are question marks regarding her involvement, as I say, but I want to talk about Tatarsky and analyse the reaction and possible motives for his killing from both inside and outside Russia. Just a little bit more about him first, though. He has reported widely from the front lines during the conflict and was considered particularly anti-Ukrainian, even amongst the hardcore nationalist communities. That just speaks to quite how fervent his support of this war and the brutal initiatives that Russia has conducted in in, in order to uh, fight in that war has has been mandated. He, he last updated his telegram feed at 2pm yesterday, a few hours before he was killed, urging the Russian army to use cluster bombs against the Ukrainians, praising the Wagner group and the Wagner adverts that he'd seen across Russia and raging against plans to build a mosque near a Russian Orthodox church in Moscow. Now, as I say, he's really hated in Ukraine for publicly demanding everybody be, and I'm quoting directly here, killed and robbed in the country, but also has enemies in Russia for exposing military failures on the battlefield and demanding that the Kremlin ramp up its war effort. Some interesting analysis from Konstantin Sonin, who's a political economist at the University of Chicago this morning. He said that something that's quite interesting by the Tatarsky case is the hallmark that it shows of of Putin's rule of the complete blurring of the lines between common criminals and the state. 
Tatarsky is a, a war propagandist, He's, but also was a common criminal before of his rise to fame. He escaped from jail before he served time for a bank robbery in 2014. He gained popularity as a social media personality and then became the darling of state channels and took part in Kremlin official receptions. Such are the favours that are given to one in Russia if you're seen as uh, assisting the Russian narrative, even if you were, as say, a, a criminal. This is a very general pattern. Prigozhin, of course, served for nine years for robbery and fraud before becoming a member of Putin's close entourage. And uh, and so there are big parallels here. There's also this fact as well, I think is important, to, which is something that uh, Mr. Sohn in Chicago talks about, is this mingling of criminals and state functionaries would have been totally impossible in, say, the Khrushchev or Brezhnev or later years of the Soviet Union. This is something that is particular to Putin's brand of, of Russian state and, uh, and how he designs it. And so this shouldn't really come as any immense surprise to us, but nonetheless is, is interesting when comparing it with other eras in the Soviet, in the Russian, in Russian history. Now, the reaction has been quite predictable. Within an hour of the bombing, influential Russian commentators were blaming Ukraine and threatening revenge. Ukraine, by contrast, has blamed Russian internal feuding for the attack. Quite an interesting remark from Mikhail Podolyak, an advisor to Zelensky. He said, the spiders are eating each other in a jar. Troubles await Russia and we will watch. So, who is it? Both can't be right. Roland, of course, regular on this podcast, has written some analysis on our website this morning. He's talked about how, of course, the first group many believe will be responsible for the Ukrainian secret services. They certainly have the, the motive to do so, given the brutality of, uh, the, of this individual and what he has advocated to take place in Ukraine. Now, there were, are certain parallels with the killing of Daria Dujina, not that she was the intended at, in target. It was her father who was believed to be the, the target, but nonetheless, it was her who was killed. And Washington believed that it was the Ukrainian intelligence services who were responsible for that attack. Originally, it wasn't clear and it was believed that it may have been the FSB who were responsible. But I believe it was back in October, an American official told the New York Times that they believed it was the Ukrainians who were responsible. That also was an instance of a, a killing by a small bomb delivered by a female operative inside Russian territory. So the parallels are leading many to assume that it is the Ukrainians. But the other major suspect that can't be ruled out is the Russian state, of course. And Tatarsky is a local and loyal associate of Pogosian. And many of these bloggers, of course, have become very critical of the way in which the Russian state has been fighting this war recently. They've criticised the withdrawal of a lot of support for the Wagner Group, for instance, and they've said that there have been huge military errors that have been made by the Russian army. It's possible that this assassination of Tatarsky is designed to show the other bloggers the dangers of criticising the way that Russia is fighting this war. That's possible. It may be designed to send a signal to Boghossian himself that the these kind of criticisms are not permissible in Putin's state. I mean, it's interesting that this uh, attack has taken place within a sort of Wagner, a, a cafe owned by Prigozhin. That speaks, I think, to, to the, the strength of the connection between the two and the visual connection between the two, which, which no doubt is, is equally as important in this. Um, and so there are many people who are believing this afternoon that this could well be a, a Russian state mandated attack that's designed to look like a Ukrainian one. But I say we'll get more. We'll, I'm sure we'll we'll know more in the coming days. Now, for what it's worth, Mr. Prigozhin himself has publicly doubted the Ukrainian government's role. He's posted on Telegram today. I wouldn't blame the Kiev regime for these actions. I think that a group of radicals is active who are unlikely to have any relation to the government. So he is suggesting by implication there that these are perhaps Ukrainian or pro-Ukrainian radicals within Russia or it's interesting he doesn't mention which government he's talking about maybe he's sort of on the sly there uh, saying that it's actually uh, Russia Russian radicals who are responsible for this thank you very much Francis for the overview there uh, James Kilner can I come to you just briefly is there anything you'd like to add to Francis's analysis hi David excellent analysis as ever I, I the only thing I'd say is that we've just in the last sort of two hours, hour and a half, one of the telegram channels, which is closely linked to the to, to Russia's FSB, published 
what appears to be part of a video of, of this woman's arrest in her St. Petersburg apartment. And during the arrest, she's interrogated by the FSB. And they've just published uh, about a 30 second snippet in which she confesses to carrying the mini statuette with a bomb inside into the cafe. We know that uh, eyewitness accounts say that the bomb exploded after a woman had given this statuette to uh, Tatarsky and killed him. In, in, in the confession in, 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 from the FSB video, she refuses to answer any more questions. She looks exhausted, obviously. She, she's very nervous. And yeah, so so that's the update. It doesn't really go us any further. doesn't move us any further on to who would have done this and why. It's only a partial confession. And we know that these arrests by Russian security services are very rough indeed. Some terrible accounts of how it's done. So we have to take all these confessions with huge skepticism and take it for what it is. Thank you very much for that, James. We'll come back to you later for your stories on Russia over the weekend. Francis, before we go to Daniel Sheridan, Francis, can I come back to you just for some military updates from Ukraine? Thanks, David. The implications of the bombing attack are already being felt on the battlefield to a certain extent. Mr. Prigozhin has claimed that from a legal point of view, Bakhmut has been captured by Russia and he's used this uh, assassination or apparent assassination in order to post a video on Telegram with a Russian flag emblazoned with the words good memory to Vladimir Tatarsky hoisted above Bakhmut. So... He is alleging that this is a very important moment, that Bakhmut has fallen to Wagner in essence, and that uh, victory has finally been achieved. Now, I should counter this at once by saying that uh, President Zelensky has given no such indication that the city has fallen to Russia. He said that the fighting there remains particularly hot, and indeed I've lost count the number of times that Russia or Wagner have alleged that Bakhmut has fallen. It's been numerous times in recent months so I don't think uh, that this is necessarily the turning point. I think rather that Prigozhin has n- recognised that his group are going to be in the spotlight thanks to this assassination and he's seeking to use this in order to elevate his own position and to make claims that, as I say, are highly contestable. The military of Ukraine has said the enemy continues its assault on the city of Bakhmut. However, our defenders courageously hold the city. Uh, They've also talked as well about how yesterday they killed 162 Russians in the city. Uh, That's off the back of 170 enemy attacks with barrel and rocket artillery in the Bakhmut section of the front. They say that some 25 combat casualties took place, during which 162 occupiers were killed and 157 more were injured. So it does speak to a very active front line rather than one that has, uh, as I say, um, led to a defeat for Ukraine, which is what Prigozhin is claiming. In terms of other interesting military analysis this morning, quite striking the MOD's piece of analysis. They've said that Russia's winter offensive from their perspective, designed to achieve total control over the Donbass, has failed 80 80 days since it began. The temporary advantage that Russia gained from mobilising some 300,000 troops in the autumn has been largely squandered, according to the British MOD, by Russia's marginal gains at the cost of tens of thousands of casualties in the eastern region. It also does a little bit more analysis into General Gerasimov, chief of the general staff, who took command, of course, of the special military operation in Ukraine in January and has been leading this offensive in the Donbass. And it makes quite interesting interesting assertion. It says that after 10 years of CGS, there is a realistic possibility that Gerasimov is pushing the limits of how far Russia's political leadership will tolerate failure. So some quite interesting, uh, it's quite rare for the British MOD to take what's happening on the battlefield and, and then imagining how that might have implications in the political space within Russia. But they've chosen to do so here. And that might be suggestive that there are some signs of, of, of real inner frustration within the Kremlin about what is going on here and the failures. I mean, I, I, my own view on some of the announcements and, and decisions made by Putin in the last sort of week or so, particularly the decision to put nuclear weapons in Belarus, is designed to detract from this catastrophic, in many ways, failure to make any real progress on the Eastern Front in the war. And so I think it's always important to be thinking about it in these terms. There is a lot of signs that things are not, all is not well in Russia at the moment. And of course,
course, the uh, bombing will speak to that as well. So that's where we are in the military space. But I'm sure that uh, there'll be some further updates. We can talk about that later. And I know there'll be some more diplomatic ones as well, David. Well, thank you very much, Francis. Can I go to um, our defence editor, Danny Sheridan? Danny, you're in Ukraine at the moment. Can you tell us a little bit about your weekend and where you are at the moment? You've, you've travelled a little bit across the country, haven't you? Yeah, hi, thanks for having me on. So last time we spoke, we were in Bucha, which is in the Kyiv region, and we've since driven about um, five and a half hours to Dnipro, which is in the east of Ukraine. Very different vibe here. When I was in Kyiv, I think I heard one alarm go off, but within moments of checking into our hotel yesterday, air raid silent sirens were going off, and that was pretty much, I think it happened like three times yesterday. So it, it feels a lot more tempted here. Kyiv's quite a bustling city, and, and um, when I went to find some dinner on Saturday night, uh, there were lots of young people milling around, people drinking in bars. It was like a, a good social scene. Here, it's a lot quieter there is definitely people going about their daily business and getting coffee and families and friends meeting for dinner in the evenings but it's 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 a lot quieter i would say in kiev and yes i think there is just that little bit more of a of a sense of tension over this way Well, thanks for that update, Danny. I'd love to talk to you a little bit about your piece that is based on interviews with Ukrainian fighter pilots. Can you tell us a little bit about them? Who are they and how do they think their war is going? Thank you. Yes, so this is my interview in today's paper with Major Vadim Voroshilov. He goes by the call name Karaya, and I'd urge people to look on this pilot's Instagram. He's he's young, he's in his 20s, and he's become a bit of a a bit of a social media um, influencer as much as he is a pilot. Um, he's really good at updating his Instagram with footage of him in the skies, um, and it's very cool to see. But anyway, we got a rare opportunity to sit down with him and his colleague, Colonel Logachov, and they were basically just setting out what the situation is right now. It's fairly bleak. They said that they are consistently having traps set by Russians that Russians have the ability because they're fighting with better jets than what the Ukrainians are using and they have ability to kind of plot and and outmaneuver the Ukrainians and they will do things like send up one jet and make the Ukrainians believe that it's a lone fighter jet and then other jets will come up and swarm the Ukrainian jet either side so they're having to adjust their tactics in order to preempt what the russians might be playing at but the major argument that came through this interview was that the ukrainians really want western jets and they just kept reiterating that flying with soviet aircraft is just not going to help them they weren't speaking in, in any sort of defeatist terminology they were saying what we're doing now is we are are holding the Russians at bay you know they were confident but they were saying that there's one thing holding them at bay and there's another thing actively winning and that they don't believe that they can really take the fight to the Russians unless they have these western fighter jets f-16s and 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 typhoons is what they're calling for we know that when Zelensky visited the uk he made a direct plea to rishi sunak to send western aircraft um and i think ben wallace the defense secretary indicated that if something like that were to happen it might be after the war so the timeline of if and when this will happen is not quite clear but it was pretty much the major point they kept on pressing throughout my time with them we need western fighter jets we need them now and they also said you know we're really competent pilots we don't need three years to be trained on your jets we could do it in six months there was this uh, they said it's a myth going around that they would need years to understand how to use these jets and also really interesting they're having um intensive english lessons so that if the opportunity does arise sooner rather than later for them to get to train on these jets, they will be able to understand the instructions, be able to speak English and learn that bit quicker. So they're basically putting everything into action so that when the time, if the time comes, they'll be able to to go after it full pelt 
And it's not just the pilots that are in need of this training. It's also engineers. But whether or not it's actually acted upon and they do get these Western aircraft is, is something that uh, no one knows the answer to just yet. Thank you very much, Danny, for that summary. I mean, it must be quite an odd experience interviewing people in, the, in their 20s who have been given so much responsibility and, and firepower, really. What was it like talking to them? In that, I mean, you know, that's quite a young age to be doing something like this. And I'm interested by what you said as well on their morale, that you sort of said, you know, a rather bleak outlook, but that they would continue fighting and weren't necess- didn't necessarily have bad morale. Did you sort of understand that? Yes, on the point of their age, I mean... They're very humble. There, there was no kind of. They don't have some sort of messiah complex or anything like that. They were just really, you know, straightforward young guys that have a job to do and want to do it to the best of their capability. Um, they weren't making any outlandish claims like we will win the war if you give us these jets. In fact, they made the point when I asked if you get the, this aircraft, is that is that how we're going to see the end of this war? They said no one can answer that question. We don't know but we just know that we'll fight a better war if we have it. So they're definitely not trying to present themselves as being the answer to ending this invasion. So, yeah, very humble, intelligent people that, as I said, have a job to do and want to do it to the best of their ability. And everyone knows that you're really only as good as as your tools. So they can be the best pilots going, but if they're still having to negotiate with outdated Soviet aircraft, how much of a good job can they actually do? Um, and I've can't, I, I'm sorry, I've forgotten your your second question. Oh, we can come back to that. I, I find this absolutely fascinating. You're, you're talking to people who are going up into the sky, you know, every other day, and yet they're giving you such an expansive interview. Did you get a sense from them of their feelings towards their supporters in the West and elsewhere? I mean, we know we know obviously some some countries are very well regarded in Ukraine for their support to the country but they're obviously asking for something as you said which may never come these western jets may never come that's certainly the geopolitical situation as as you've laid it out how did you get i mean how did they feel about that are they sort of grateful in some respects but you know they're still asking the questions i think they're incredibly persistent and i just don't believe that they will take no for an answer i think that to them it makes perfect sense that they need Western aircraft, we should give it to them. And they will keep asking until hopefully we will relent. They were grateful to Poland and Slovakia um, for committing to send fighter jets to Ukraine. However, these are still the, the MiG-29 bombers, um, which aren't the, the best aircraft going, but better than nothing. But yes, I... I, and they did reference, you know, really grateful to to those Western nations that have donated kit and they highlighted the kit that the UK has given, such as the Challenger 2s, um, the Challenger 2 tanks, the 14 of them that we have donated. So there were nods of appreciation to what we have done, but it all just circled back to now give us the aircraft. And um, I, I do believe that they will just keep asking. I, I don't think that, that their voice will ever tire of pushing this request. Thanks, Daniela. Is there any, anything else you'd like to talk about? Um, I know that you're on a bit of a, a schedule today. Where, where are you off to in, in the next few hours, in the next few days for your reporting? Oh, I think I'm going to say watch this space because we should have some good dispatches coming up. So keep tuning in and buying the paper and, and hopefully that will oh. pique some interest. Well, thanks very much, Danny Sheridan, for joining us from Dnipro. It's hugely grateful here here in London for your reporting, and do stay safe. Thank you very much, Danny. Thank you. Double Virginia. James Kilner, can I come to you next? You were on the Moscow desk over the weekend. There's an awful lot of updates to get through. Would you could you start just by talking us through this awful story, really, of the Wall Street Journal journalist who has been arrested in Russia? Right, okay, so that all happened at the end of last week. He was arrested in the Ekaterinburg, as we know. It was about 900 miles east of Moscow. He was on assignment for the Wall Street Journal. Uh, I think he'd been posted in Moscow for five years. He'd worked for the Moscow Times, as on France Press and uh, the Wall Street Journal. And he was considered an experienced and well-regarded journalist. He was arrested, I think, Wednesday evening in a sort of steakhouse in Ekaterinburg and then moved to one of the FSB's main prisons in, in, in Moscow, the, the Lofotovo prison, which is um, 
19th century prison, been used by various Russian and Soviet security services throughout its history, first by the Tsarist Russians and then by the Bolshevik MKVD uh, and then KGB and most lastly FSB. When it was uh, taken over by the Stalin NK, N- NKVD, um, they used it to process uh, thousands and thousands of people during the great purges of the 1930s. Some of them were murdered, ma- many tortured in this terrible place where really the main aim of this place is holding prison really to extract confessions head of show trials which we um you know the were at some point down the line in a few months time they've got to put this poor american journalist evan up for a show show trial uh, and they'll be trying to interrogate him using various techniques to get some sort of confession before the trial good cop bad cop uh, various uh, isolation techniques keep the lights on all day 23 hours a day in, in prison cell all foods you know but that sort of thing so it's going to be a, t- a terrible time for the, for the poor journalists um, it's, a, it's a really dire situation that really shows how far russia has fallen since its full-scale invasion of ukraine last february this is the first Western journalists, both US journalists, to be arrested and charged with spying in Russia since 1986. So those are the optics nearly 40 years later. We now have an American journalist sitting in prison in Russia. Thanks very much, James. And obviously from all of us, you know, all the solidarity to to Evan and his friends and family waiting for news from him. James, can I get your thoughts as well on this? It was a rather fascinating intelligence update from the British MOD that you wrote up over the weekend looking at the behaviour and the competence of Russian troops in Ukraine. There was quite a lot of detail in it. Could you talk us through what you found? Right. So this is the daily uh, morning briefing from the MOD, the British MOD. And on Sunday, I think it was, they released a message which was called my, you know, it was rather striking. Firstly, it said that Russia had suffered 200,000 casualties since uh, its full-scale invasion 13 months ago, which is just such a huge number. Now, casualties is dead and injured. And of course, uh, Dom will, you know, will go into this in, in much more detail, hopefully sometime later this week or next week, whenever he's back. But um, as far as I know, it's sort of, you work on a one to three basis, so out out of two hundred thousand, twenty five percent might be killed and and seventy five percent might be badly injured. But anyway, that's two hundred thousand men taken out of action in just over a year. Now, as a comparison in my story, I referenced that in a decade of warfare in Afghanistan in the late seventies and throughout the nineteen uh, eighties, Soviet Union lost twenty thousand men in Afghanistan killed. So. We have a huge, huge cost to the Russian army from this war, which the British MOD leaked on, on Sunday. Alongside this, they also said that a lot of the deaths, although obviously the fighting has killed or injured most of the people, most of the Russian soldiers. And we have to have, we have to also keep remembering that many of these Russian soldiers who have been killed are mobilized men pressed into combat with very little training. But the MOD also said that, um, drunkenness, fighting, and vehicle crashes were also a great contributor to this terrible death toll, death and accident. As we know, as we were reporting on alcoholism's rife in, in, in Russia, it really runs through society. And the MOD's point was that militaries and armies, they reflect that, that the society that they're recruited from. And this is, you know, obviously the case here in the Russian army in Ukraine where it said that alcoholism has undermined operations, the Russian military operations. And we've also seen evidence of this throughout the last 30 months when uh, the Russian army was forced to retreat from Bucha or around Kharkiv or Kherson last year. Often their forward operating positions were scattered with vodka bottles and beer bottles as well as cigarette butts and, and, and pot needle uh, you know, discarded pop needles, et cetera, et cetera, and socks and clothes and, and all sorts of stuff. So we, we, we've seen throughout that alcohol has played a role in, um, in, in, the, in the Russian army. I've reported, I remember reporting on a story last summer where some FSB officers and some Russian soldiers had a punch up and, and a shootout in a cafe in Hesson when it was occupied. And that had all been about drinking and rowing and fighting, et cetera, et cetera. 
So yeah, that's what the MOD was was telling us on uh, on Sunday, and they were interesting story, and I think it's my experience of living and reporting Russia. It's entirely accurate. Well, thank you, James. I'm sure Francis will have some thoughts on that. I'll come to Francis later. James, could you talk us through one more of your stories? Obviously, the the countries surrounding Russia to the south uh, are a huge part of your work. Could you talk us through this story from Armenia that has said that it won't arrest Vladimir Putin despite preparing to join the International Criminal Court? What's happening in Armenia? So this is a very true story, which I think the Telegraph is probably one of the only major story uh, newspapers to report on it. So it's been rumbling around for about 10 days now. A week ago last Friday, the Armenian Constitutional Court approved a request from the Armenian government to look at how it might integrate the Rome Treaty, which governs members of the International Criminal Court in the Hague. Now, the Armenian government had asked for this assessment because it wants to prosecute Azerbaijani military commanders that it accuses of various crimes in a war that Azerbaijan and Armenia fought in 2020. So it's the Armenian government's motivation was to prosecute these Azerbaijani commanders. It wasn't to go after Putin. That has to be clear up straight away. But accidentally, the timing was incredible. It, the Armenian constitution court approved Armenia's potential membership of the ICC a week after the ICC had put Putin on its wanted list and labelled him a war criminal for proving the abduction of thousands of children from occupied parts of Ukraine. Now, by being put on the wanted list, this obligates the ICC's 123 members to arrest Putin if he turns up on their territory for a conference or a meeting or whatever. And so, theoretically, by approving potential membership, becoming an aspirant member of the ICC, Armenia would also be obligated to arrest Peter. Now, as Telegraph readers and, and listeners to, to your podcast will remember, will we'll know, Peter's travel has been severely crimped since he read the uh, since he the Ukraine. Yeah, he's, he's considered a pariah. He's not welcome across much of the world, etc. And last year, after invading Ukraine in February, he confined himself to visiting all five Central Asian and former Soviet Central Asian states and Armenia, as well as a side trip to Iran in July uh, by St. James. So suddenly, uh, 10 days ago, we had ex Soviet Armenia, which has always been an ally of, of Russia, although relations have become extremely strained in the last 12 months. Suddenly, we have Armenia shifting towards joining the ICC, which has labelled Putin a war criminal and potentially threatening to arrest him if he turns up. Now, obviously, the, in, in Yerevan, the capital. Now, obviously, the Kremlin wasn't having any of this and put out a very strictly put out a, a statement warning Armenia that there would be severe negative consequences if it went through this. Within th- three days, it banned dairy imports from Armenia, etc., etc. And then on Sunday, yesterday, the Armenians started backing down. They said, well, actually, you know, we've got to think about this. Just because the ICC says that Peter's a criminal, it doesn't mean he's been uh, guilty of anything. And we can assure the Kremlin that if this Putin turned up in Yerevan for another conference, he wouldn't be arrested. So... This in itself is incredible. This is the first time since the ICC said, uh, uh, placed Putin on its on its wanted list, that we've had an aspirant member state or an, or, or an aspirant member or a member state of the ICC having to confront the reality of potentially either arresting Putin or challenging the Kremlin's ability to travel, challenging his ability to travel uh, into their country. And we've seen how powerful the Kremlin is. It, it warned Armenia, it banned its, its products, and now Armenia has had to back down. So we've had a very, very interesting diplomatic sideshow in the Kremlin's backyard going on over the last 10 days. A fascinating walk to watch. I think it's got uh, some way to, to go. Armenia still hasn't officially joined the ICC. You know, that's got to happen. So... It's definitely a watch your space type of thing. Thank you very much for, for that, James. Um, Francis, I know you've got a few more diplomatic and political updates to bring us, but any reaction to any of the things James was talking about there first? 
Thanks, David. Well, staying in the diplomatic space, it's been a big 24 hours for Finland. We've heard in the past hour that Finland will formally join NATO tomorrow. That's according to Jens Stoltenberg, ending a process that really began not long after Putin's invasion of Ukraine and which has been held up in recent months by Turkey, something we've covered extensively on the podcast That'll come as some consolation to Finnish Prime Minister Sanna Marin, but I imagine it's going to be a tough week for her because she has lost over the weekend her close-fought election to the centre-right rival party led by Pateli Orpo. Orpo, I understand, as we speak, is choosing to build a government with the right-wing Finns party, or at least he's entered negotiations with them first. He had the choice of doing that with them or with uh, Marin's Social Democrats, but he's chosen to speak to them first. And that may or may not have some implications on the war in Ukraine. I should say that this was not an election fought extensively on the issue of Ukraine. It's been largely on immigration and on the economy. Issues which um, Sanna Marin has clearly not been uh, seen as quite in tune with public opinion, despite her own extensive popularity. And so we don't necessarily think this will have a a massive, a massive change. But nonetheless, it will be, I'm sure, a frustration to Ukraine and President Zelensky to lose one of the big champions, really, of their country in recent months. She's gone viral many times in her very clear articulation of what she believes is at stake in Ukraine. And so this is an example of where inevitably, because of just the natural cycle of democracies, that some of these leaders that we've become many used to, uh, so used to in recent months will inevitably lose their seats, lose their jobs as, as running the country. And so the, the, the European landscape will begin to change. And the only question is whether that will lead to a natural change in how Europe sees Ukraine or whether perhaps more likely, and certainly in the case in the Finnish example, that there will just be examples of parties that will be elected on other issues, but the stance on Ukraine will remain the same. That would certainly be what would happen in Britain, for instance, if next year, if many believe there'll be an election next year here, if Rishi Sunak were to lose, the Labour Party were to be elected. It's believed that that will lead to very little change on the Ukraine stance. It appears that's the case with Finland. And so significant, but not necessarily a game changer. But more on that as we have it. Poland, also an interesting development today. They have said they have supplied some of the pledged MiG-29s to Ukraine. Danielle was obviously speaking about this earlier on, that this is not necessarily the aircraft that Ukraine would want. But nonetheless, it is important, I think, and significant that these are actually being sent and received. They were the first country that said they would be doing so, but it's off the back of a fellow NATO member, Slovakia, who have announced they've also shipped their batch as well. So things are moving in a positive direction in the direction that clearly Ukraine feels is paramount for the counteroffensives to come, though whether these planes would actually be able to be used in that remains to be seen. We seem to be talking about Poland all the time at the moment. Of course, uh, President Biden visited there a few months ago. We had Prince William's visit last week. The, Europe is really waking up to the important role that Poland is playing in shaping the Western defence response to Ukraine, particularly on that eastern flank where uh, on bordering Ukraine specifically. I think what's so interesting here is that whilst Poland is not traditionally at least, conceived as one of the great European military powers. I think you'd say that France, Germany and Britain would would traditionally have that role. What they have managed to do is leverage what power they have in a really targeted way for maximum impact. They are actually willing to leverage their influence and have done so most effectively in a way that's actually arguably put certain other countries to shame in their response on Ukraine because they've said one thing and they've done another or at least they've found that reality has met a sort of different place than where they maybe would want to be. Poland has not over-promised and under-delivered, uh, quite the reverse, arguably, whilst there are many who are saying that there are instances of countries that have done quite the opposite, really, most particularly perhaps Germany. And in that space, there has been a development today, which is that Germany's defence minister has ruled out sending any further weapons or equipment to Ukraine, admitting that the Bundeswehr will already not be able to replenish its stocks by 2030. 
you know, the German armed forces have been really blighted by chronic underinvestment by their own admission since the end of the Cold War. But this was meant to be a transformative moment for them. Uh, following the invasion, many will recall Olaf Scholz's speech where he talked about this being a Zeitenwender, a uh, world transformational moment. And really, uh, Germany's response has not been as robust as in the way that many hoped. I'll read a quote from uh, Boris Pistorius directly. He says, to put it bluntly, like other nations, we have a limited inventory. As federal defence minister, I cannot give everything away. So uh, naturally, you can imagine there's been a lot of frustration with this this morning. People who feel that, you know, once again, Germany is sort of letting the side down for right or wrong. And uh, it sort of speaks to a narrative that is now formulated, which is some of these powers like Germany, like France, have said one thing in terms of their strong response to Ukraine. But it's actually been up to countries in the Baltics and uh, countries like Poland to really do a lot of the heavy lifting and who have maintained a clarity of purpose and have not deviated from it from the invasion last year onwards. Whereas a lot of these other countries seem to have had a rather uh, wavy path to where they are now, uh, to put it mildly. But last Lastly, I do just want to, and I know Dom spoke about this a bit last week, I do just want to end on the UN because obviously over the course of the weekend, the UN Security Council presidency did uh, transfer to Russia, as is natural. It, It goes in these cycles and Russia was next up. But it does seem, and this is exactly how the Ukrainians have put it, that them assuming the presidency on April the 1st is a bad joke. Uh, It's a stark reminder, this is from Ukraine's foreign minister, that something is wrong with the way international security architecture is functioning. Russia has usurped its seat. It's waging a colonial war. Its leader is a war criminal wanted by the International Criminal Court for kidnapping children. They are taking to the level of absurdity to a new level. And I just think that captures really the mood amongst many diplomats at the moment that you've seen a country that in many ways has destroyed the foundations of uh, the UN Charter and the principles of the international community. And uh, yet it's sort of it's business as normal in terms of how uh, those procedures are working. Now, it doesn't necessarily change much in terms of what Russia will be able to do in this seat. But, you know, it's it's symbolic important and they will be able to change the tone of conversations uh, as a result of them doing it and Ukraine are claiming that it would have been possible to stop them that's been contested but there is a feeling I think that perhaps more could have been done to at least condemn this I get the sense that um, this is sort of an embarrassing thing that's happened here and so people don't really want to draw attention to it but I think it's right that we do so because certainly the Kremlin will be so that's where we are in the diplomatic space David always lots happening but particularly this week weekend with what elections and um, other quite big announcements coming in from from leading powers. Well, thank you very much, Francis Sternley, uh, James Kilner, and earlier Danielle Sheridan calling in from Dnipro uh, to join this podcast today. Um, I think it's time for our final thoughts. So James, if I could ask you to go first, what will you be uh, looking at over the next few days? Well, David, I think it's got to be this assassination in uh, St. Petersburg and the fallout from that. Just scanning across the um, Russian news agencies now and uh, the Russian Telegram channels, Telegram is a social media network which is uh, heavily used by Russian language media, uh, bloggers, etc. And um, the discussions around who could behind, be behind the murder are just flying around everywhere. There's loads of different theories about whether it's Ukrainians, about whether it's influencing in Russia. Obviously, uh, the uh, Navalny supporters have also been accused of being involved there. Um, something they say, I think that is going to rumble and rumble, and we're beginning to see we're beginning to see fractures, more and more fractures in 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 Russia, and people clearly, I think, prepared to take very direct, serious action to change uh, how things are. Thank you very much. Uh, James, Francis, would you like the very final thoughts? Thanks, David. And I echo James's analysis. This is a really important story, one that will have big domestic implications, I think, in Russia and also will inevitably lead to some concern, I think, amongst Western diplomats as to the way in which this war is becoming increasingly uh, brutal. Now, my own view, of course, is that Russia doesn't need excuses in order to escalate this war. They've been fighting it in the most brutal manner, a ruthless manner possible ever since the invasion last year. But there are some in the West who do still perceive that it's dangerous for these kind 
kind of attacks that take place on Russian soil. And so this will have, I'm sure, some interesting implications on some of the dialogues that are taking place with Ukraine if they are responsible, or indeed the perception is that they are responsible for this. America may have um, some concerns. For instance, I remember they did around the previous assassination. So watch this space. It's an important story, I think. But I did just want to end on something else. I was not here on Friday, and that was because I was recording with another British podcast that people will be familiar with. It's called Ukraine Cast, and they were very kind to have me on. It's They cover the war for twice a week. We were discussing some of the major geopolitical changes that have taken place since the war began and also discussing this idea of war being an engine of history, accelerating trends already taking place. But the reason I mentioned that, just further to thanking them for having me on and and pointing listeners there if they want to listen to that episode uh, where we're talking about those themes, is it just underlines something that, that journalists, we're really trying our best here when I was speaking to them afterwards to give as much space to other publications, other to our own as we can. We, of course, on this podcast, try and draw attention to any newspaper or outlet that's covering this war and that provides interesting insights or reports that we haven't um, yet done. And so I just thought this spoke to that and they've been very keen on it. And I thought that's a great thing. But also, of course, as we've spoken about today, it's really important that we remember that it comes as a, at a cost for those reporters who are actually on the ground bringing us the news that we bring to you. Of course, in this case, it's the Wall Street journalist Evan Guskovich operating in Russia and other hostile environments who put their freedom and lives on the line in order to bring us accurate information. Podcasts like Ukraine The Latest and Ukrainecast would be nothing without them. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first three months for just £1 at www.telegraph.co.uk forward slash Ukraine the latest. Or sign up to Dispatches, our Ukraine newsletter, which brings stories from our award winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a Ukraine live blog on our website where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day, including insights from regular contributors to this podcast. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so you don't miss it. To our listeners on YouTube, please note that due to issues beyond our control, there is sometimes a delay between broadcast and upload. So if you want to hear Ukraine the latest as soon as it is released, do refer to podcast apps. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider following Ukraine the latest on your preferred podcast app. And if you have a moment, leave a review as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing ukrainepod at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. And you can contact us directly on Twitter. You can find our Twitter handles in the description for this episode. Ukraine The Latest is produced by Louisa Wells and Giles Gear, And today on Twitter, Rachel Duffy.